Okay, for the first part of the test, you're going to be asked to solve radical equations. So looking at something like this, x plus 3, the square root of x plus 3 is equal to the square root of 1 minus x. The first thing we do is if we wanted to do this by hand, we would isolate the radical. So get one radical on each side of the equation or just simply get one radical. Um, there's not always going to be two radicals, but you have to completely isolate the radical. So these are both isolated, so then we undo the radical using the correct inverse, so squaring both sides of the equation, so that our root cancels out with our power in both sides. And then left is just x plus 3 on the left, and is equal to 1 minus x. And then from there, we'll just combine like terms. So correctly, though, we've got to bring x over, so I'm going to add x to both sides. So I have 2x plus 3 is equal to 1, and then I would solve for x algebraically piece by piece. So we have 2x is equal to 1 minus 3 is negative 2, and then we would divide both sides by 2, and then x is equal to negative 1. Now we would check our answers by plugging it back into the original problem. So we have the square root of negative 1 plus 3 is equal to the square root of 1 minus negative 1. So we have the square root of 2 is equal to the square root of 2. And that is true. So we've checked it. That's a true statement. So we're done. Our answer is truly x is equal to negative 1. All right. Now you could have done this problem by simply graphing each of these in your graphing calculator and then doing where do they intersect. So you do second intersection and you can find where they intersect using your calculator. Okay. So check. So solve and check for extraneous solutions. So the first thing we have to do is isolate the radical. Nothing added to it, nothing multiplied to it. Well, this one is isolated, so we're going to undo the radical. So I'm going to square both sides of the equations. I have to put x minus 6 in parentheses. So my root cancels off my power, so I have 6x minus 45 is equal to x minus 6 squared. Now, because of this 6x, we cannot just isolate x piece by piece and solve. Um, it's not in vertex form. Vertex form would not have that extra x in there. So we've got to rewrite this um, on the right side as x minus 6 times x minus 6. And then we're going to distribute that through. So we're going to have x squared minus 6x minus 6x, and that's plus 36. And then we'll simplify that side combining all like terms. So we'll have negative 12x plus 36. And that's equal to, over here, all this stuff on the left. We still have that, 6x minus 45. Well, it's quadratic, and we need to get our quadratics in standard form and set equal to 0. So I'm going to bring 6x over, and I'm also going to bring, at the same time, 45 over, using the correct inverse. Now, look over on the left. That adds up to be 0, which is what we want. So we have 0 is equal to x squared minus 18x. And then we have plus 81. Plus 81. So then from there, it's in standard form. It's set equal to 0. We would factor because it's quadratic. So we would do what multiplies to be a times c, what multiplies to be 81, and adds up to be b. b is negative 18. So negative 9 times negative 9 multiplies to be positive 81, and it adds up to be negative 18. So our factors are negative 9 and negative 9. So we know we can quick factor because our a value is a 1. So it factors to be x minus 9 times x minus 9. And those are our linear factors. So we set our linear factors equal to 0. So we set x minus 9 equal to 0, x minus 9 equal to 0. And then we solve for x in each problem. So I add 9. So I get x is equal to positive 9, and then I'll get the same thing over here. x is equal to positive 9. So we get x is equal to positive 9 twice, but we only need to write it once, and then we would check it by putting it back into our original problem. The square root of 6 times 9 minus 45 better be equal to, um, we're plugging in 9, 9 minus 6. So plugging in 9. So then we have the square root of 53 minus 45 is equal to 9 minus 6 is 3. And then we have the square root of 9. 53 minus 45 is 9 is equal to 3. So we have 3 is equal to 3. And we've checked our answer. It's a true statement. So x is equal to 9 is our answer. And we get to keep it. 
You really need to check your answers though. On the test there will be extraneous solutions. Now we could have just graphed it in our graphing calculator, the original problem, the square root of 6x minus 45 and then graphed x minus 6. We would have seen where they intersect. So I'm going to do this one using the graphing calculator because a lot of you should just use your graphing calculator. So the square root of 6x so I'm going to do this once again by um, the graphing calculator. So we'll see. Okay, the original problem was the square root of 6x minus 45. And then the second equation was x minus 6. So that's just a line. So we have x and then minus 6. And I hit graph. So I'm going to look for where they intersect. Oh, you know what? Did we check our answers correctly? Okay, there we go. So right here we're seeing, okay, so it looks like they intersect or maybe they don't. Let's see here. So if we look up closer in here, um, we'll see if they intersect and it doesn't look like they do. So this one would have been no solution. So I must have checked that one wrong when I plugged it back in. So let's go back and see what I did wrong with my algebra. So we had, oh, that's what I did wrong. Six times nine, six times nine is 54. So 54, when I plugged it in, 54 minus 45 is, no, that was right. Okay, let's see here. I'm trying to figure out what's going on here. So we do second trace to see where they intersect. And, oops. Intersect. Enter. First curve. So I'm on the, um, the root equation. I hit enter. Now I'm on the <coughs> line. I'm on the line, so I hit enter. And then it says, do you want me to guess? You hit enter again. So they're intersecting at 8.9999, so that rounds to 9. So they are intersecting at x is equal to 9. And we knew that because we solved algebraically and we got it. But I'm just showing you how to do it using your calculator as well. A lot of you need to not do the algebra and you need to just use your calculator. Or every single one of you should be doing both and checking your answer. So we get x is equal to 9. So that's good. I don't know what happened right there. It was graphing something weird. So x is equal to 9 was correct. Moving on. So really, guys, you should be doing problems 1 through 4 using your calculator. You graph it in your graphing calculator. See where they intersect. You do second trace and intersect. Just make sure you don't miss anything. So if they have two intersection points, make sure you, you have it accordingly graphed correctly. Okay? All right. So let's continue on here. Okay, so looking at these two, we have a of x is equal to x over x minus 2, f of x is equal to x over 3, and we want to find f minus a of x. So remember we rewrite these as f of x and order matters, so it's f of x minus a of x. So that order did matter. So we're taking our f of x, which is 3 over x, and we're subtracting a of x, so subtracting x over x minus 2. So then from there, we're going to simplify, and it's considered simplified if we have one fraction. So we need to be able to add or subtract fractions. We need a common, de a common denominator. So this one has an x. It needs an x minus 2. This one has an x minus 2. It needs an x. So we have to do that to the top and bottom, as you know, so that we don't change anything. Because remember, this is just a fancy one. So then we'll distribute that through. On top, we'll have 3x times Negative 2 times 3 is negative 6. And then we have minus x squared. And then we put it in standard form. So that's on top, right? So we have it in standard form. On top we have negative x squared. And then plus 3x. And then we have minus 6. So I was really careful with my signs when rewriting this. And that's all over x times x plus 2. My x minus 2. And right there is our answer. That is considered the most simplified form. Okay? So let's do the one off of the review. So we were looking at this and we were asked to find f minus g of x. So we'll rewrite it so we know exactly what we're doing. That's f of x minus g of x. Okay. So let's go through and write this out. So f of x is 2 over x plus 1. And we're subtracting g of x, which is x over x minus 3. Now once again, to simplify these, we have to get a common denominator. So we're going to multiply this one by x minus 3. But if you do that to the bottom, you've got to do that to the top. And then this one, this x minus 3 needs an x plus 1. If you do that to the bottom, you must do that to the top. 
Okay, so now we'll distribute very carefully. So we have 2 times x, which is 2x on top. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. Now we have to distribute this negative through. So what we're really doing is I'm going to cross the line and make this a negative x. It's the same thing. So that I just don't make any sign errors. So negative x times x is negative x squared. And then negative x, that's where usually people miss it. They forget to multiply the negative the second time through. Negative x times positive 1 is negative 1x or negative x. Same thing. So now I've distributed. I've made care the, I was really careful with subtraction, right? We're always careful with subtraction. And then we're going to combine like terms on top and write it in standard form. So we have negative x squared. 2x's minus 1x's is positive 1x's. So plus x and minus 6. And then that's all over the x plus 1 times x plus 3. And then right there is where you're finished with this. Okay? So that is simply f of x minus g of x. That's all you have to do. So now we're going to do p times q, g of x. So we know that this means p of x times g of x. So times g of x. Okay, so p of x times g of x. So we're going to take our p of x, which is the square root of 2x, and we're going to multiply it to g of x, which is a big thing. So I'm going to write it in parentheses. 3 minus x plus the square root of 6x. And then from there, we want to distribute accordingly. So square root of x times 3 is just 3 square roots of x. Make sure you don't multiply something that's not under a root with something that is. So then we have... Square root of 2x times x, which is, or times negative x, so we have negative x square roots of 2x. And then square root of 2x times the square root of 6x. Since they're both under the square root, we'll put them both under the root and multiply together that. 6 times 2 is 12, and then we have x squared. So then from there, we'll look at our radicals and make sure they're simplified all the way. This one's simplified all the way, this one is. But 12 and x squared can break down more. 12 breaks down into 4 times 3, 4 breaks down into 2 times 2, and then x squared is x times x. Now we're pulling out groups of 2 since it's a square root, so there's a 2 that can leave and x that can leave. So we pull out a 2, we pull out an x, and left was the 3. So we would have, this would be our final answer. We would have 3 square roots of 2x, minus x square roots of 2x, and then we would have plus... 2x square roots of 3. And none of those are like radicals, so this would be our answer. Let's do one like the one off the test review. Okay, so we're taking f times g of x. So we're taking f times g of x. So we have the square root of 3x, and we're multiplying it to, and I'm going to put it in parentheses, 2 plus the square root of 6x. So from here we're going to distribute. So three, square root of 3x times 2 is 2 square roots of 3x. Remember, you can't multiply something that's not under a root with something that is. So this is what we have. And then the square root of 3x times the square root of 6x. They're both under the square root, so we can put them under the same root. That's the square root of 18x squared. And then from there, we break down 18. 9 times 3. 9 breaks down into 3 times 3. x squared is x times x. And we're pulling out groups of 2 since it's a square root. So there's 2 right there, 2 right there. So this simplifies to be 3x on the outside and left underneath is 3. So we have 2 square roots of 3x underneath and then plus 3x square roots of 3. And that would be our final answer. So you should be able to do, um, well, let's do one more. Okay, so on number 7, we're asked to find g plus h of 2. So what we're going to do is, since this is plus, we're going to add g plus h. So we're going to add 3x minus 1 plus, so that's g, plus our h of x, which is negative 3x squared plus 1 plus 2x. And since this is addition, we don't have to be careful with any signs. We can just add like terms. So we have negative 3x squared, and then we combine 3x plus 2x, which is 5x. And then we have negative 1 plus 1, which is 0. So we have, there's g plus h of x. But we want to plug in 2. We're substituting it in. Do not make the mistake of saying that's multiplication. If we have f of 2, you substitute in 2 wherever there's an x. Well, that's what we're doing here. We have technically h of, we have g of h of 2. So we're substituting in 2 in wherever there's an x. So I have negative 3 times 2 squared plus 5 times 2. And I'm going to do negative 3 times 4, because 2 squared is 4. We have to do that first. 
and then plus 10. So we have negative 12 plus 10, which is equal to negative 2, and that would be our answer. So that's the similar to 5, those are 5 through 8 on the test review. Okay, find the inverse of this one. This is one of the trickier ones. Um, with this one, I would, with inverses, we always do the first thing. We always rewrite it. f of x is the same thing as y, so we have y is equal to x minus 5 over x minus 3. Then our first step with inverses is to switch x and y. So wherever there's an x, I'm going to write a y. Wherever there's a y, I'm going to write an x. So we have y minus 5 over y minus 3. And then from there, we're going to solve for y algebraically. Well, we don't want to go fractions, so we're going to multiply both sides by y minus 3 so that we don't have to go fractions anymore. Because then over here on the right, they cancel out. So we have y minus 3 times x is equal to y minus 5. And then from there, we're going to distribute our x through. So we'll have xy, x times negative 3. So negative 3x is equal to y minus 5. And then we're trying to solve for y. So what you want to do is get all your y's on the same side of the equation and anything else on the other side. So I'm going to bring y over, subtract y. So we have xy minus y. And we still have minus 3x is equal to negative 5. Now, once again, bring anything else that's not a y that does not have a y to the other side. So I'm going to add 3x. So what I have is xy minus y, because those add up to be 0. And then I have is equal to 3x minus 5. So then from there, I'm going to look at these two terms and say, oh, they have a y in common. So I can factor out, if both terms have it in common, I can factor it out. So I factor out a y, so I divide each thing by y. So then left right here is x and then minus 1. Remember that negative y divided by y is negative 1, not 0. So we have 3x minus 5, we're almost there. And then solving for y, left step, divide both sides by x minus 1. And then y is now isolated, so our inverse, f inverse of x, is equal to 3x minus 5 all over x minus 1. And this would be our answer. Okay, so, and state the domain and range. Okay, so domain and range. I, we have not even, I haven't been paying attention, and I don't think a lot of you have been doing that. And that's a huge part. So, domain and range. So, let's look at our first function. What is the domain? I'm going to do it in purple. So the domain of our original function, you look for where is the problems. Well, we cannot have a zero in the bottom of a fraction, and we cannot have a negative number under a radical. So looking right here, our domain is going to be, okay, the problem is this cannot equal zero. So we're going to restrict it. We're going to say x cannot equal three, because if it was equal to three, then our bottom of our fraction would be zero. So our domain, x cannot equal three. Well, our domain on our original function is our range on our inverse function. So our range is x cannot equal 3. And then we go back. Okay, so now we're going to do our domain on our inverse. So our domain, we look for problems. Well, the bottom cannot be equal to 0. So x cannot equal 1. So if we know our domain cannot equal 1 on our inverse, then our range on our original is going to be equal to the domain on the inverse. So x cannot equal 1. So this would be our domain and range of our original, and this would be our domain and range of our inverse function. Okay, I'm going to do number 11 um, from the um, review. So we're finding the inverse, and we're stating the domain and range. So with inverses, we always switch x and y, but first we know y is equal to f of x, so I'm going to rewrite it as a y instead of f of x, and then we switch x and y. So x is equal to negative 2 plus y plus 1 squared. And then algebraically, we're going to solve for y piece by piece. So I'm going to add 2 to both sides. Now be careful, because x plus 2 is not 2x. x plus 2 is x plus 2. So we have x plus 2 is equal to y plus 1 squared. And then we take the square root of both sides of the equation, not forgetting the plus and minus. Our root cancels out our power. So we have plus and minus the square root of x plus 2 is equal to y plus 1. And then last step to solve for y is subtract 1 
from both sides of the equation. And now y is by itself. So there's our inverse. There's our inverse. So now we'll say our domain and range on each. So I'm going to do my domain on the original function. So here's our original function. Do you see any problem areas? No. Nope. There's no fractions and there's no radicals. So our domain is going to be all real numbers. Well then what's our range on our inverse function? It is all real numbers. Now we're going to find our domain on our inverse function, which is this. So you look for the problem areas. So we know we cannot have a negative under the radical right here. So we have to say x plus 2 has to be greater than or equal to 0. Because if it's less than 0, then it's going to become negative. Then solve for x. So we'll subtract 2. So we have x must be greater than or equal to negative 2. So that is our answer for our domain on the inverse. Our domain is x values must be greater than or equal to negative 2. So our range on our original function will be x values must be greater than or equal to negative 2. All right. Hopefully that helps. Okay. All right. So find the inverse of y is equal to log the base 7 of 2x minus 3. Our first step is to switch x and y. So we have x is equal to log the base 7 of 2x minus 3. Inverses, the first thing we do is switch, oops, so 2y minus 3. So we switch x and y. That's our very first step. And then algebraically we solve for y. So you have to isolate the log, which our log is isolated. Now we need to undo the log. So we'll take the base 7 of both sides. So we have 7 raised to the x power is equal to base 7 and log of the base 7 cancel out. So we have 2y minus 3. And then we'll just solve for y algebraically piece by piece. So we're going to add 3, add 3. So we have 7x plus 3 is equal to 2y. And then we will divide both sides by 2. So there's our answer, y is alone. So f inverse of x is simply equal to 7 raised to the x, and then we have our plus 3, and then is over 2. All right, so let's find the inverse of 11c. So on number 11c. So this time we're finding the inverse. With inverses, we always switch x and y. x is equal to negative 3, y plus 8. So then we algebraically solve for y piece by piece. We subtract 8. Subtract 8, so we have x minus 8 is equal to negative 3 raised to the y. Now, because y is up here in the exponent, we've got to be really careful on how we bring that down. We've got to bring it down correctly. Well, guys, this is an exponential function. It's 3 raised to the y power. It's exponential because our variable is in our exponent. So we've got to isolate the base completely. Well, that negative is not good. So we've got to divide both sides by negative 1. So now I'm going to divide x by negative 1, and that's negative x. And then negative 8 divided by negative 1 is positive 8. So I just divided that negative 1 through to both of these things and got this. So we have negative x plus 8 is equal to 3 raised to the y power. And that is an exponential function. So to be able to bring that down, what is the inverse of exponentials? Logarithms. So we've got to take log to the base 3, since this is base 3, and we've got to do that to both sides. So now log to the base 3 and base 3 cancel out. So on the left, we have log to the base 3 of negative x plus 8, and that's equal to y. And what do you know? We've solved for y, so that's our inverse. Right there's our answer. All right, so you should be able to do problems 9 through 12. Now recall on number 12, that one should be really easy. You will see one like that on the test. All you have to do is say, what are my points? So what are my x, y points? And then you take your x, y points. So let's say one of the points was 2, 0. The inverse would be 0, 2. So you'll plot those points, figure out what points they are, switch x and y, and then plot these new points. That's all you have to do for number 12. Okay, sketching the graph. First thing we do is we see where our shift is. So we know that underneath is our shift left and right, and we always go the opposite. So we're going right 5, and then anything added on the outside is our shift up and down, and so we're going up 3. Whatever's added on the outside, your sign stays the same. So we're going right 5 and up 3. There's our starting point. And then from there, we know the 1, 3, 5 rule. You go up, 
You go up A, up or down A, and then over 1, 3, 5. 1, 3, 5. So we go up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, 2, 3, and then up 1 over 5, but that's going to be all for a graph. And that's all we do for the square root function. So then domain range. Our domain is x values. How far left and right does it start? On the x-axis, guys. Look on it with your eyeballs on the x-axis. It starts at positive 5. So it starts at positive 5, and it's growing forever to positive infinity. Now, 5, it was included in it. It started right on 5. Now, our range is our y value. So now you're looking on the y-axis, guys. How far up and down does it start? Boom, right there. At 3. So it starts at 3, and it grows upward into positive infinity. All right, let's graph a cube root. It starts out the same way. Our shift left and right underneath the radical is always opposite. So we're going left 5, and then we're going down 3. So left 5, down 1, 2, and 3. And then from there, since it's a cube root, it starts out the same way as a square root. So you always go up your A value, which our A value is a 1, right? So up 1, and then over 1, 3, 5. So up 1 over 1, up 1 over 1, 2, 3, up 1 over 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. So we can draw in the top half. Now with cube roots, it also goes the other way, the opposite. So down 1 over 1, down 1 over 1, 2, 3, and then we could keep going, but that's good. So that's our graph for a cube root. Very similar to a square root, yet a little different. Our domain is our, how far left and right is it growing? Well, it's growing that way forever and that way forever. So our domain is all real numbers. Our range, well guys, it is continuing to grow also that way. Very slowly it's growing that way and it's gonna keep going, but it's gonna keep going very gradually. So our domain range, our range is also growing to positive infinity and negative infinity, which is all real numbers. Okay, so you should be able to do 13 through 16. All right, so with number 17 and 18 on the review, um, we're asked what is the end behavior in words. So in words, you would just take it. So on number 17, for example, you have f of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4x minus 3. Graph it in your graphing calculator and look at it. So for example, if you were looking at something like this, if you graph this in your graphing calculator and got this, your end behavior in words would be up and up. You look at what's happening at the ends. So it's up and up. So now it says, as x is approaching, let me move this over, oops. Okay, so as x is approaching positive infinity, which is over here, where's our function growing to? Well, it's growing to positive infinity on the y-axis. So as x is approaching negative infinity, which is this direction, as x gets to negative infinity, where's our function growing to? Well, it's growing up that way. So it's growing to positive infinity. Then looking at a picture over here, for example, this one in end behavior, you always work from left to right. So this one would be up and down. So up and down. So it's going up and it's going down. So as our function, as x grows to positive infinity, so as our x values grow to positive infinity, where's the function growing to? Well, it's growing to negative infinity. And as x grows to negative infinity, which is over this way, where's our function growing to? It's growing to positive infinity. So that's how end behavior works. So you should be able to do 17 and 18 now. Graph them in your graph calculator and look at them. Okay, we're going to solve this equation. So we have 2 over x minus 3 is equal to 4 over x minus 3 plus 5. When solving radical, I mean not radical, sorry. When solving rational fraction equations, we have to get a common denominator. So notice we have 2 over x minus 3 is equal to 4 over x minus 3 plus 5. Well, what's my denominator on 5? Technically a 1. So just write it in. Now you will want to find your least common denominator. So this has an x minus 3, so we'll definitely need an x minus 3. Um, this one has an x minus 3, we've already listed x minus 3, and then we have a 1, so times 1. So really we don't even need to multiply by 1, because anything times 1 is just itself. So our common denominator, our least common denominator, is going to be x minus 3. So we're going to go through and fix anything that needs to be fixed so that we have x minus 3. 
This 2 over x minus 3 is good. 4 over x minus 3 is good. But we do need to fix our denominator on 5 over 1. So we're going to multiply the bottom and the top, because you can't just do it to one piece, by x minus 3. Now we need to put that in parentheses. All right. So now look at your bottoms. Because we're solving and this is an equal sign, we can now ignore the whole bottom since we have a common denominator. So left on top is 2 is equal to 4 plus, and then we're going to distribute positive 5 times x, which is positive 5x, and then positive 5 times negative 3 is negative 15. So then from there, we're just going to solve algebraically for x. So I'm going to add 15 to both sides to get x alone. So 17 is equal to 4 plus 5x. Then from there, I'm going to bring 4 over correctly. That's subtract 4. So that's 13. So we have 13 on the left is equal to 5x. And then we'll divide both sides by 5. So x is equal to 13 over 5. And that would be our answer. And we would check it as well by plugging it back in. I would probably, when plugging it back in, possibly use the decimal depending on how big the decimal was. Um, it might be easier. All right, so you should be able to do 19, uh, 19 through 22. All right, so simplify and use absolute value signs when needed. So we have the square root. It's just simply a radical. We're simplifying it. So we break it down into its prime factors. 9 times 2, 9 breaks down into 3 times 3, and then x to the 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and then y to the 7, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Now we did learn a more advanced way, quicker way of doing this, but I just honestly, some of you need to just go back to basics and do it this way, so I'm just going to show it this way. Because it's a square root, we're pulling out groups of 2. So we pull out a 3, there's 2x's, 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 2y's, 2y's, 2y's. So left underneath was a 2, left underneath was a y. So we're pulling out a 2, and then we're pulling out an x times x times x, which is x cubed. We're pulling out a y times y times a y, which is y cubed. And then left underneath was a 2 and a y. So then we would put absolute value signs where needed which is the even, even, odd rule. Do we have an even root? Yes. Do we have an even power? Yes. Do we have an odd answer? Yes. So we need to put absolute value signs around that. And then do we have an even root? Yes. Do we have an even power? No. So we do not need absolute value signs. So our answer would be 2 times the absolute value of x cubed, y cubed, and then we have left underneath with the square root of 2y. So this would have been our final answer. All right, simplifying something like this. We have 5 over the cube root of 6. I'm going to rewrite this one as 5 over the cube root of 3 times 2. Now remember, I want to get rid of, well, you know what? I'm not even going to confuse you. I'm just going to do it this way. So I think most of you would opt to go this way instead. I think most of you would say, okay, I need to rationalize the denominator because we can't have radicals in the bottom. So I'm going to multiply by, since it's the cube root, we need three of them, so we need two more sixes. Because once again, the reason we're doing that is because on bottom then we would have the cube root of six cubed, so that our root cancels out our power. Anyways, you've got to do the same exact thing to the top and bottom. So we have the cube root of six times six. So on top we have five cube roots of 36, and then on bottom we have six. And then you would see if 36 breaks down further, um, and it, it does, the cube root of 36, 6 times 6, 3 times 2, 3 times 2, but there's not 3 to pull out. So you put them all back underneath, and we end back up at 36. So this would have been our final answer. 5 and 6 don't simplify further, but if on the outside, they did. So let's say this would have been uh, 12 over 6. Then we would simplify it to be 2 over 3. So just, oh, sorry, 2 over just 2. So we'd have 2 cube roots of 36. So just be careful. But our final answer would have been 5 cube roots of 36 over 6. And because 5 and 6 don't simplify any further, this would be our final answer. But if they did, you would simplify. Okay, something like this. The square root of 14x over 
Um, I mean, 14xy cubed over the square root of 28x squared y. I like to put it under one radical first and simplify. So I put it like this. All under one radical, since they're under the same radical, um, you can do this. And then I simplify what's underneath there. So 14 and 28, this divides to become, they both divide by 7. So... Oops, sorry about that. Sorry, one half. Sorry. They both, okay, so they both divide by 7. They both actually divide by 14. I'm sorry, that's what threw me off. They both divide by 14, and that becomes a 1, and this becomes a 2. And we have x over x squared. So we have x over x times x. And we have y, y, y cubed over y. So if you need to go back to basics like this and do it, do it. So we have our x's divide out, a y's divide out. So left on top is a y squared, and left on bottom is an x. So we had a 2 on bottom, so we had this. We had, uh, on top we had a 1, we had a 1, and we had a y squared on top. So on top we have y squared. And on bottom we have x and a 2, a 2 and an x. So then from there, we would split it back up. We have the square root of y squared, and on bottom we have the square root of 2x, and that's considered not simplified because we have a radical in the bottom. So we would rationalize the denominator. So I'm going to multiply the bottom by the square root of 2x and the top by the square root of 2x. Now, what we have underneath is the square root of 2xy squared, and on bottom we have... 2x. The square root of 2x squared on bottom is just 2x. Then we pull out anything we can. We'll look right here. We have a y squared, which is y times y, so we should pull out a y. So we have a y, and left underneath was the square root of 2x, and on bottom we have a 2x. And then from there we're done, because we simplified everything. We cannot divide the 2x under the radical with the 2x that's not under a radical, so that would be our most simplified answer. So you should be able to do 23 through 27. Okay, so what's the function's exponent is the function exponential growth or decay? And then what's the y-intercept? And then graph the function. So first of all, is the function exponential growth or decay? We always look right here at our b value to see if it's exponential growth or decay. And since one half is less than one, this one is decay. Exponential decay. Now it says, what is the y-intercept? Well, that's always when x is equal to 0. So to find the y-intercept, we always plug in x is equal to 0. So we have 2 times 1 half raised to the 0 minus 3 plus 5. You'll type it into your calculator, and you'll get... Two times one half, one divided by two, close my parentheses, raise it to the, make sure you put it in parentheses if your calculator is uh, TI-83. Your exponent is zero minus three, so I'm just going to put in, and make sure you type it in correctly. You can't put in my, okay, let's see. So we're putting in zero minus three, and then get out of your exponent. So you've got to make sure you type it in right, and then plus five. I hit enter, and I get 21. So our answer for our y-intercept is 21, and that is correct. So it's equal to 21. Okay, so from there, then we're going to graph it. So our first step is to see where's our shift. We're shifting right three, that's our shift left and right, right three and up five. One, two, three, four, five. So we draw in an asymptote, if you remember how these exponentials work. And then we, um, from there, go ahead and just, um, from there you'll plot your initial value. So from there, so we went right 3 of 5. So this was our new origin. Now remember, you took this origin and you shifted it right up here, right 3 and up 5. So now we're just pretending like this new origin is our starting point. So then from there, you go up your A value, which is this. So you go up 2, up 1, 2, you plot that point. Then you'll just use your calculator and type it in 
and look at the function and draw a pretty, a rough function's good enough for me. Um, so you can get a few points to the left and a few points to the right. You'll look at your x values, but a rough function is good enough for me. So that's, that's what that'll look like. All right, so you should be able to do 28 through 29. All right, so it says write as an exponential. So we have log to the base 1 over 32 is equal to 5. And we want to rewrite this logarithm as an exponential. So we've got to do that using inverses. So we have log to log of the base 1 half. So what we're going to do is we're going to take 1 half of both sides. So we're going to take what base 1 half of both sides. So then 1 half and log of the base 1 half cancel out and we're left with 1 over 32 is equal to 1 half raised to the 5th power. Oh, and I, I think I messed that one up. Anyways, we'll do another one. We'll do another one from the actual review. So let's do another one from the review. Okay, this one's better. So we want to rewrite this as an exponential. So we take, okay, we have log of the base 3 of 81 is equal to 4. We need to undo log of the base 3. So we take base 3 of both sides. Then base 3 and log of the base 3 cancel out, leaving us with 81 is equal to 3 to the 4th power. Now type that into your calculator. That should be 81 is equal to 81. So you know you can check your answers by um, just typing it into your calculator. But this would have been our answer. This is rewriting it as an exponential. So let's go the other way. Let's write an exponential as a log. So we're going to have base 2 raised to the 4th is equal to 16. Now remember, this is an exponential. We know that exponentials and logs are inverses. So we need to get base 2 away. So we're just going to take log of the base 2 of both sides. So then log of the base 2 and base 2 cancel out, leaving us with the 4 which is equal to log to the base 2 of 16. And you're done. That is rewriting an exponential as a logarithm. All right, so you should be able to do 30 through 37 now. Okay, so now we're going to approximate log to the base 2 of 5. Remember that our calculator doesn't know how to type that in. So we use the change of base formula, and we know that's equal to log of 5, log of the big in size, divided by log of 2. And now you can just type it into your calculator. You hit the log button, log of 5 divided by log of 2. So log of 5 divided by log of 2, and type that in, and you should get 2.3. So 2.32, and it's a big decimal. So I'll tell you on the test what decimal to round to. Okay, so we're going to simplify this one. We have log to the base 9 of 9 to the second. We'll look at it. Aren't log and exponentials inverses of each other? So isn't log to the base 9 and base 9 where it cancels out, leaving us with a 2? So our answer is 2 on something like that. All right, so you should be able to do 38 through 41. So we're going to solve this logarithm logarithmic equation. We have log of negative 3x plus 2 plus log of 2 is equal to 3. The most important thing, so important, so very important, is you combine your logs into one single logarithm using properties of logs before you do anything. So notice over here on the left, we need to combine this into one log. So properties of logs are go hand in hand with exponentials. When you multiply, you add. When you add, you multiply. So see the addition sign here. And there are two separate logs. We're going to put it into one log by combining it. So you're not going to do multiplication here. Do you, I hope you understand that we're just taking these two separate logs right here, right here, this log, and we're combining it with this log using properties of logs. So because we're um, adding, we multiply. So we're going to have log of negative 3x plus 2, and then times 2, is equal to, so we put it in one log, is equal to 3. Now that we have it in one log, we can undo the log by taking the base of both sides. So this one's base 10, right? Because if we have just a log, we know there's secretly a base 10 there. So we take base 10 of both sides of the equation. So then log of base 10 and base 10 cancel out. We have negative 3x plus 2 times by 2 is equal to 10 to the third power. So 10 raised to the third power is 1,000. So we have is equal to 1,000. So 
So then from there, there's a couple different ways you could solve for x. Now, remember, what is our goal? We're just solving for x. So I'm going to divide both sides by 2 so that that goes away. So we have negative 3x plus 2 is equal to 500. And then we subtract 2. So we have negative 3x is equal to, we would subtract 2 from both sides of the equation. So we have this one, um, same thing, we're going to combine it using properties of logs. So it happens to be subtraction, so we divide again. So we have 4x plus 2 divided by 2 is equal to 1. Then you undo ln, taking base e of both sides. So we have 4x plus 2 over 2. And ln and e cancel out, that's why we have 4x plus 2 over 2 is equal to e to the first power. And then we'll algebraically solve for e. I multiplied a couple different ways to do this one. Actually, I'm going to just simply say, okay, um, 4x and plus 2, they all, all three things divide by 2. So this became a 2, a 1, and a 1. So what we have was 2x plus 1 divided by 1 is just itself. So we have 2x plus 1 is equal to e to the first. And then algebraically, we'll just solve for e piece by piece, subtract 1. So we have 2x is equal to e to the first, which is just e, so e minus 1, and then we divide both sides by 2, and now x is a lump. So x is equal to e to the first, or e minus 1, all over 2. So that would be our answer. Okay, so we're going to solve this equation. We have 2 raised to the x minus 5 minus 7 is equal to 10. I'm going to first isolate the base, so I add 7. So we have 2 raised to the x minus 5 is equal to 17. Then we undo base 2. x is in the exponent, so we can't just divide by 2. We've got to do this correctly. This is base 2. It's an exponential. Well, undoes exponentials, logarithms. So we have log of the base 2 of both sides. Log of the base 2 and base 2 cancel out. So we have x minus 5 is equal to log of the base 2 of 17. Well, then from there, on the right, we have to use the change of base formula to be able to calculate this. So we know that's equal to log of 17 divided by log of 2. That's the change of base formula. So we have that, and then we have x minus 5. So what we can do here is solve for x, add 5, add 5. So we have x is equal to log of 17 over log of 2 plus 5. Now you'll calculate that, just be really careful that you hit enter right here first, and then add 5. So you'll do log of 17 divided by log of 2. I'll type it in so you can practice. Log of 17 divided by log of 2. You hit enter, then you're going to go plus 5, and you get 9.08. So x is equal to 9.08. Then you could check your answers by plugging that answer back into your original problem wherever there's an x. But you've got to use the full decimal. So if you were plugging this back in, you type in 2, and then you would type in the full decimal. So 9.087462841. And then it was minus 5. And then we have minus 7. Anyways, when you plug it back in, use the full decimal, which you can use the answer. So you can hit this second key on your calculator and then answer. And that will put that decimal back in for you when you do that. Anyways, make sure you check your answers. I hope you know how to do that. All right, and if you do type this in, if you do 2 raised to that, minus 5, and then minus 7, you will get it's equal to 10. So you know you've done it correctly. So you should be able to do 42 through 49. Um, find the inverse of each of these. We've already done examples like that. And then do 50 through 51. Okay, we're going to solve this one. We're almost done with this video. First things first is notice this is a quadratic. It does not have a middle term. So I'm just going to isolate x squared. Because it doesn't have a middle term, I'm just going to isolate x squared. So we have 2x squared is equal to 20. Divide both sides by 2. Now, once again, it's because we're missing the x. Remember, this is only because we're missing the x we can do this. So we have x squared is equal to 10. Then we take the square root. So root cancel out power, x is equal to, don't forget, plus or minus the square root of 10. So there's our answer. Two answers, which makes sense. It was quadratic. It should have two. And we're almost there. Looking at
have this one solved. We have negative x minus 5 squared minus 10 is equal to 20. Notice this is in vertex form and it has no bx. So it's in vertex form and it has no bx. So what we're going to do is isolate the, the quadratic. So I'm going to add 10. So we have negative x minus 5 squared is equal to 30. And we've got to completely isolate it. So first we divide by negative 1. Super important. x minus 5 squared is equal to negative 30. And then we will take the square root of both sides. So we have x minus 5, because our root counts all our power, is equal to, now with the square root of negative 30, that breaks down into 5 times 6, 6 breaks down into 3 and 2. And we cannot pull out anything, but we can pull out the negative, that's an i. So we have i square root of 30, and then we will get x along, last step, add 5 to both sides of the equation. And we won't forget the plus and minus, my fault, we have plus and minus, so we add 5 to both sides. So we have x is equal to 5 plus and minus, so it's positive 5, right? Plus and minus i square roots of 30. So this is our answer for x. Now remember, we can only skip those steps because we had no bx. Notice there's not an extra term in here that has an extra x. If it did, we would rewrite this out by re multiplying it out. Okay, almost there. We have 3 times the absolute value of x minus 3 minus 5. So what we have to do is isolate the absolute value. Add 5 to both sides. So we have 3 times the absolute value of x minus 3 is equal to 9. Divide both sides by 3. So the absolute value of x minus 3 is equal to 3. And then the next step is, once you've isolated the absolute value, set it equal to the positive and negative answer. So x minus 3 is equal to positive 3. And also, x minus 3 will be equal to negative 3. You set it to the positive and negative of that answer. Then solve for x in each case. Add 3, add 3. x is equal to 6. And you will add 3, add 3. So x is also equal to 0. Then we would check our answers by plugging them back into the original problem and making sure that they work. So we have 6 minus, so we have x 3 times 3. So we have 3 times the absolute value of 6 minus 3 is 3. Minus 5 is equal to 4. So we have 9 minus 5 is equal to 4. So that answer works. So we will keep 6. And if we plugged in a 0 back into the original problem here, we have 3 times negative 3. Well, the absolute value makes it positive. So we have 3 times negative 3, but the absolute value of negative 3 is positive 3. So we're actually doing 3 times positive 3, which is 9, and then minus 5 is 4. So both answers check off, so we also get to keep 0. So both answers will be correct. Alright, so almost there, we have solving this. We would isolate the exponential, add 5 to both sides of the equation. We have 3e e to the x minus 2 is equal to 9. Divide both sides by 3. So we have e raised to the x minus 2 is equal to 3. And then what undoes e? We have to get the x down out of the exponent, but we can't do it incorrectly. So we're going to take that ln. ln and e's are inverses. So ln of both sides. So ln and e cancel out. We're left with x minus 2 is equal to the ln of 3. And then your last step is to add 2 to both sides of the equation. So we get x is equal to the ln of 3 plus 2, and you can type that into your calculator. ln, you just type it in, ln of 3 plus 2. And it's 3.09. So x is equal to 3.09. All right, so you should be able to finish... You should be able to finish those problems. Now, if you need help with the story problems, you need to watch video 3-5. So video 3-5 is the story problems in detail. So make sure you, if you need help with story problems, you watch those.